He will return to Jerusalem. Zion's king will restore the land. The clouds will part, and our king will descend with fire in his eyes. Seven stars with right hand. Yeah, 
Praise the Lord. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Well, we're having some really good worship anointed by the Holy Spirit. And I think for our our audience out there in Internet world, you can sense the presence of the Lord uh, just as we can here right in Palm Harbor, Florida. But we're glad to be connected with you and all of you that are here now, it's just a, a beautiful Shabbat, and we're going to continue now with the Shema on page 15 and 16. You know, and every time we say the Shema, what do we do? We face Jerusalem, the city of peace. Those who pray for the peace of Jerusalem, those who love her will prosper, the scripture says. Here it is today, another peace deal made with one of Israel's former sworn enemies, Sudan. What, what the heck is going on? The Lord is doing something magnificent. Blessed are the peacemakers. Another peace deal. Uh, another uh, Islamic nation recognizing the Jewish state. Opening up diplomatic relations. You know, this is what we want. And uh, it's a beautiful thing to see. And it's God is doing something marvelous. Now, I'll say something else about it. The nation that stands with Israel will be blessed. God will bless those that bless Israel. The the leaders that stand with Israel will be blessed. There's leaders in this country and and others, but in this country that want to accuse Israel of ridiculous things like being an apartheid state, which just is absurd. They want to accuse Israel of uh, all kinds of phony things and implement, boycott, divest and sanction measures. Uh, we've, got, we've got congressmen and senators that are pushing for those kinds of things against the Jewish state. To heck with them. This nation is blessed because it stands with Israel. And the leaders that stand with Israel, they're going to be blessed. Their constituencies are going to be blessed. It's just a great principle. So I'm really thankful. that, And I think there's going to be more uh, in the very near future. But here's another one. And as we celebrate that tonight, we face Jerusalem and say together the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kevod, Malchuto Leolam Vayed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed is the name of his glorious kingdom for all eternity. Amen. Praise the Lord. Page 21 and 22. Now we'll continue in the English with the Amidah. Blessed are you, Lord our God and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob, the great, mighty, and awesome God, the most high God, who bestows grace and creates all, and remembers the righteousness of the fathers, and brings a redeemer to their children's children for his name's sake with love. O King, helper, savior, and shield, blessed are you, O Lord, shield of Abraham. 
ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו ואלוהי אבותינו אלוהי אברהם אלוהי יצחק ואלוהי יעקב האל הגדול הגיבור והנורא אל עליון גומל חסדים טובים וקונה הכל וזוכר חסדי אבות ומביא גואל לבני בניהם למען שמו באהבה מלך עוזר ומושיל מגן ברוך אתה אדוני מגן אברהם אמן. 23-24 You, O Lord, are mighty forever. You raise the dead. You are mighty to save. You sustain the living with grace. Resurrect the dead with abundant mercy. Uphold the falling. Heal the sick. Set free those in bondage. And keep faith with those that sleep in the dust. Who is like you, master of mighty deeds? And who can compare to you, king, who causes death and restores life and makes salvation sprout? And you are faithful to resurrect the dead. Blessed are you, O Lord, who resurrects the dead. Amen. Atagi bor leolam Adonai, mechayei meitim, atarav lehoshia, mechalkel chayim bechesed, mechayei meitim berachamim rabim. Somech noflim verofei cholim, umatir asurim, umekayem, אמונתו לשני עפר, מחמוך בעל גבורות ומדום מלח, מלך ממית ומחיה ומצמיח ישוע, ונאמן עתה להחיות מתים, ברוך אתה אדוני. מחיי המתים. Amen. Praise the Lord. We've got another uh, miraculous thing happening right now. The Tampa Bay Rays in the World Series. They're in game three right now. You know, how about it? I mean, the, uh, I'm not a hockey fan, but the Lightning won the Stanley Cup. Now we've got the, the Rays playing for the, the World Series. One of the things I like about the Rays is that they are one of the smallest budget teams in all of baseball. They have a very small budget. They, they work with uh, very limited funds, but they, somehow they stand up to the best. And they're really, they're really doing something. So, you know, we, we, hope, uh, we hope that they uh, bring that championship home, but uh, we'll see. Now we're going to turn to page 13 and 14 for the Shamru prayer, together in the English. The children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat, observing it throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Shabbat to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Yeah, yeah. 
We'll continue with the Torah service. Amen, page 63 and 64. When the ark would travel, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let them that hate you flee from you. For from Zion will go forth the Torah, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Blessed be he who in his holiness gave the Torah to his people, Israel. Vayehi bin Suharon, Vayomer Moshe, Kum Adonai, Vayafutsu Oibecha, Vayanusu Misanecha, Mipanecha, Ki Mitzion Tetze Torah, Ki mitzion teitze Torah, Udevar Adonai, Mi Yerushalayim, Baruch Shenatan, Torah, Torah, Baruch Shenatan, Torah, Torah, Le'amo Yisrael, B'Kedushato.
Zod HaTorah, Asher Samoshe, Libne Bene Yisrael, Al Pi Adonai, Biyad Moshe. And this is the Torah that Moses placed before the children of Israel by the mouth of the Lord, by the hand of Moses. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Parsha this week is Noach. It's Parshat Noach. And we will be reading from Genesis 6, verses 9 through 12. Genesis 6, 9 through 12. Yamod Akiba ben Moshe la Torah. Baruch et Adonai Hamparach. Baruch Adonai Hamparach Leolam Vayed. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Alam. Asher Bachabanu Mikal Ha'amin. V'natan Lanu et Torato. Baruch Ata Adonai Noten HaTorah. Amen. Ele Toledod Noach. Noach ish tzadi tamim. Haya bidrotav. Et ha Elohim hitalech Noach, v'yoled Noach shlosha banim et Shem, et Cham v'et Yafet, v'tishach et haaretz, l'ibnei ha Elohim v'timale haaretz Hamas, v'yar Elohim et haaretz, v'hinei nishchata, ki Hashchit ko basar et arko al haaretz. Amen. Genesis 6, 9 through 12. These are the genealogies of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. He was blameless among his generation. Noah continually walked with God. Noah fathered three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was ruined before God, and the earth was filled with violence. God saw the earth, and behold, it was ruined because all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Amen. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu torat emet, v'chaye olam nata betochenu, baruch atah Adonai, Notain ha Torah. Amen. Mi shebeirach avotenu. Abraham Yitzchak v'yakov v'yaborech et Akiba ben Moshe v'shem Yeshua HaMashiach. May he who has blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, bless Akiba, son of Moshe, in Yeshua's name. Shabbat shalom. Good job, Akiba, Kevin. <laughs> Kevin's got a cool Hebrew name, doesn't he? Akiba. <laughs> well, <laughs> we are going to put the Torah back in the ark now as we turn together to page 73 and 74 for the Etz Chaim prayer. It is a tree of life to those who take hold of it and those who support it are praiseworthy. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Bring us back, Lord, to you, and we shall come renew our days as of old. It's
everyone could be seated at this time. So I have a couple of things to show you all. First, we want to say Shabbat Shalom to all our friends watching. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Yes, that's from our hearts to you. And uh, we're never far in spirit. The Lord's with everybody. He's a big God and he can do anything. How many believe in that? Yes, absolutely. And I've been saying lately that the Lord is closer than your very own heartbeat. We never doubt that, not for one second. So thank you, Lord. Um, I have this beautiful shirt I want to show you. You guys can see that. So on the back, it says Temple New Jerusalem. Our motto is one people, one God. Amen. That's it. And it's in the Hebrew. And on the front, it just, you know, it just says one. And in the Hebrew there, a little quick lesson, it says echad. So there you go. So if anyone would like a t-shirt, please, please let us know in the back. We are going to be play, placing an order soon. So we go ahead, we need your, um, your payment, we need your size, and um, how many you want. If it's um, male or female, because they come in a V or a round neck. So you at home, you can always call the office and get one. They're kind of cool to wear, and it gets a lot of people's attention. And it's nice enough where you could just wear it out. So also, we want to show you guys our Hanukkah gift bazaar. Here it is, guys. So our next collection at Gulf Coast Jewish Family Services is our Hanukkah Gift Bazaar collection. And so what it is is they are hosting their annual free shopping event to all their clients. And it's the miracle of Hanukkah coming into the homes of each one of their clients. And um, we're asking for your help. So we have a list of items from Judaica to new underwear, socks, gift cards, we have um, teen gifts, such as unopened makeup, sports supplies. So just be thinking about maybe some ways, something you may have had at your house for a while that's maybe even collecting dust that you don't know about, but you're going to find out when you look <laughs> in your garage. And um, just bring it on out. We'd really, really appreciate it. So we just want to quickly review the announcements. Um, Joey Stepakoff is the main speaker we're going to have here. Yeah. <laughs> so the date for that is Friday, October 30th, and um, he's gifted and anointed speaker. He's well known in the Messianic Jewish conferences, and um, he both national and regional. He's on the he's one of the executive officers of the YMJA. So he is going to come forth with a fabulous power packed message for all ages across the board. So we don't want to miss out on that. And um, we have our temple builder cards. Just don't forget that to fill them out because the office will be calling you. And we always say here at TNJ that every single person has many gifts and talents Amen. to share and use for God's glory. Even if it's taking a broom and sweeping the front or being a greeter or anything. Uh, very, very important to use the gifts God's given you to bless others because you're doubly blessed back. Amen. And so I wanna go ahead and continue. We have our TNJ volunteer appreciation party coming up. Friday and Saturday, November 6th and 7th, you make the difference blessing others. So please don't miss out on this joyful time. Just honoring the volunteers, everything's done in excellence. And we also have our Hanukkah celebration around the corner from that. <laughs> so that date is Friday, December 11th. Latkes, spin the dreidel, guilt, music, door prizes, and so much more. So again, there's another party. And uh, this is um, something that also Yeshua celebrated. For those of you who may not even realize that John 10, 17, he went into, it was winter, and he went into the temple according to his custom for the Feast of Dedication. Amen. So here we see, again, uh, a model that we are following because Yeshua did that also. And um, he honored Hanukkah, and so do we. And also... Um, Remember that the flyers will be out shortly for the Israel tour for November 2021. And if you would like more information, please call the office for you at home. In person, we will have the flyers available. And um, you can go ahead and look that over. And we have a mission statement here at Temple New Jerusalem. It is Jewish and non-Jewish people together in Messiah for the salvation and restoration of Israel. One sentence, vision, not visions, vision, for the restoration of Israel. And so we're all in it together. And for those of you who also want to join the dance, 
come on up and just join the circle. We want guys and gals of all ages to go ahead and join in at home. At you at home, you can also join in. Don't forget, you could just stand up right where you are and dance and praise the Lord. Right, everybody? Yes. <laughs> so thank you so much. We have our tithe and offering box in the back for your convenience. And there is a scripture verse that goes with that. It is to honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. So that is from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. Thank you so much, everybody. God bless you at home. God bless you all here. We love each and every one of you and your families. And uh, we want to say Shabbat Shalom. But now for a power-packed message from Rabbi Michael. Thank you. This week's Parsha is called Noah, which means Noah, of course. And I think everyone in the world has heard about the flood in ancient times. Um, even people who don't believe in it, you know, they, I think practically everyone's heard the story of Noah and the flood that wiped out the human race in ancient, ancient times. Uh, it is interesting, I think, that in almost every other culture, not just the Jews, but uh, almost every culture in the world, they have in their writings and in their traditions, in their myths, some account of a worldwide flood. It's very common. In other cultures, the details vary, and unlike the Bible, they're not uh, completely reliable. But it is very common to find that. Now, according to the Bible, Genesis 6, 11 through 13, the reason that the Lord gave for the flood is clear. It says the world became filled with something called Hamas. Now, the earth was ruined before God, and the earth was filled with Hamas, which is translated there, violence. And it's no coincidence that the terrorist group that that really is the government of Gaza calls itself Hamas, you know, because they think it's cool that they're violent, <laughs> I guess. But um, Hamas is also translated as unrighteousness, injustice. You know, when there's no justice in a society, then what you've got is Hamas. And, uh, and you have violence also. But that's the meaning of it. Violence, injustice, unrighteousness. God saw the earth and behold, it was ruined because all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh is coming before me. For the earth is filled with Hamas because of them. Behold, I am about to bring ruin upon them along with the land. So it was the world became a dark, corrupt, unjust place. Nothing like today, of course. <laughs> and you have to wonder, how did it happen? You know, how did this sad state of affairs come about? Well, like today, the ancient world knew that there was a God who created the world and everything in it, including humankind. They knew that. Most people know that today, too. You know, this is an amazing statistic. Uh, the recent Pew Research poll found that just 4% of Americans identify as atheist. You know, you, you might think that it would be more than that, but uh, it seems like it would be, but just 4%, it's a very small percentage um, that identify as atheists. 
5% identify as agnostics, which as I understand, means uh, to be an agnostic means not knowing. You know, so those are people who just say they're undecided. They're like the undecided voters. Is there a God or isn't? And, and, uh, but then atheists, they just say that they believe that there is no God. But even put those two together, it's only 9%. So the, my point is that most people believe in a God. They believe that there is a God. And the U.S. is typical of most Western nations in that regard. Um, atheism is much higher in Asia, especially in China, which you know is the communist China and communist nations tend to uh, cultivate atheism. It's one of the, the great precepts of Karl Marx, you know, atheism. But um, the point is that what happened before the flood the reason why the world became so full of Hamas, justice, unrighteousness, violence, was not due to atheism. It wasn't due to people not believing that there was a God. They knew darn well that, that there's a God and that he created the world. And most probably in those days, they even knew the story of Adam and Eve. You know, um, Adam, after all, he, the guy lived to be 930 years old. He died like 120 years or so before Noah was born. So, you know, right up to 120 years more or less before Noah was born, Adam was walking around. People knew who he was, you know, and there weren't that many people in the earth. So he's, he was probably a pretty popular guy. You know, people would stop him in the street and say, hey, tell me about Eden. <laughs> you know, tell me about this place. I want to know, you know, what's it like? Uh, but there was, a, there was a testimony in the earth during those early generations of what went down. You know, not only Adam, but Seth, uh, his son, after Cain slew Abel, and there were others. Um, you know, people like Methuselah, Enoch. And these people lived long lives. Seth, 912 years. Methuselah, 969. Would you want to live that long? I mean, yeah. I, you know, yes. I think, you know, yeah, as long as you're in good health. And, you know, why not? I'll take it. I'd rather live forever, really. How about you? You know, but uh, the, if that was uh, the only alternative... Yeah, I mean, I would still want to retire at 120, you know, get a, a place on the beach, <laughs> you know, and a metal detector, I'd go out in the mornings with the little headphones, but, you know, do that for 800 years, it beats the alternative. But, uh, you know, there were a lot of people around for a long time who were witnesses that there was a God who created the, the world and there was this Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve lived and how humanity started. They, they knew, people knew, most people knew, just like today. They knew, they believed that there was a God. So that wasn't really the problem. They knew the deal. They weren't ignorant. The fact was that people simply decided that they were not going to follow the Lord. It wasn't that they were ignorant about his existence. They just decided they were just not going to do it. Instead, they began early on to see themselves as masters of their own destiny. It's kind of, I'm going to draw an analogy here. Uh, when a young man or woman reaches a certain age, say 18, maybe 20, and uh, somewhere in that ballpark, and they start to, to realize, you know, my mom and my dad were great, I love them, but I got to go and live my own life. And not theirs, but my own. And that's normal. It has to happen. For natural parents, it's a pivotal life moment. Some parents don't want to let go, you know. Uh, but that's, we're talking about earthly parents, earthly mothers and fathers, you see. But our Father in Heaven is different. You can't say to our Father in Heaven, Abba, you've been great, but 
I got to go live my own life. Because as the Lord has said, I am the life. You can't say to him, I'm going to go live my own life, not yours, Father. Say that to your earthly father. It's a natural course of events. It can be actually kind of a healthy thing at times, especially if you don't have a good dad. But this life, as he said, I am the life. This life, life itself, belongs to him. And he's living it in us. Unless you choose to go and be the master of your own destiny, which you can. But good luck. And we're always teetering on that. So the people in ancient times did not deny the Lord outright. They said in their hearts, God is good, but we will be the masters of our own destiny. And that's the key problem. And with that, people turned away from the Lord. And so the world became filled with Hamas. You know, one thing about the Lord is often said, it's, he's amazing. He is amazing, isn't he? Amen. The Lord is amazing. In Adam's day, they were no different than in our generation. Um, as they went forth from Eden, they began to multiply in the earth and to fill the earth. And they went to work and they began to, to really be amazed with their own accomplishments, with the things that they were doing as humans. You know, wow, this is cool. Look what I've done. And they lost interest in the Lord as they became more amazed by themselves. This is purely an analogy, but I have always been intrigued by the Greek story, the ancient, uh, the myth of narcissus. You know, when you say someone's narcissistic, it means that they're self-obsessed and and in this myth, uh, Narcissus uh, saw his own reflection in a pond and he, he became so obsessed with it that it was like he was so stuck on himself that he couldn't even live life and he couldn't uh, receive love from anyone else either. And, you know, that's a very human trait. A lot of those stories reveal things about human nature. I think that's the idea of them, uh, just like plays and and uh, novels and that sort of thing, but um, it's a very human trait, and we have to be careful about it. In the ancient world, they became so amazed by themselves, they turned away from the Lord. They followed after their own desires, and when that happens, love grows cold, and the world becomes filled with Hamas, selfishness, corruption, a dog-eat-dog, kill-or-be-killed world. Truth becomes irrelevant because what matters is winning. And if you have to lie, cheat, steal, hurt others, it's all okay because the end justifies the means in that way of thinking. And the Lord looked down upon what was going on. And by the way, this is exactly what's going on today. I think you've figured that out by now. There's no difference between the world then and the world now, except people lived longer. But the Lord looked down upon it, and he saw how the world had become filled with Hamas, and he said, the end of all flesh is coming before me. Behold, I'm about to bring ruin upon them. Or put another way, therefore, I will wipe the slate clean and start again. Or put another way, reboot this thing. <laughs> Give me one man, 
one tzaddik. tzaddik. A tzaddik is a righteous man. And him I will spare with his family and we'll start all over. So Genesis 9, 10, it says that, it says in the Hebrew, Noach ish tzaddik. Noah was an ish, which means man, tzaddik. He was a, Noah was a righteous man. Noach ish tzaddik. These are the gene, genealogies of Noah. Genesis 6, 9 through 10. Noach ish tzaddik. Noah was a righteous man. He was blameless among his generation. Noah continually walked with God. Noah fathered three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Notice how Noah walked with God. You know, he, he lived humanly, but he walked with God. And that's, that's really the fulfillment of messianic life, to walk with God. And, uh, you know, we, we, we still... We still have to live humanly. Even Yeshua lived humanly. When he was hungry, he had to eat. When, you know, it was time, he had to uh, relieve himself. You know, he, he ate and drank with his disciples. He, he, they had times of laughter and crying. They were, uh, uh, they were human who followed him, and he was human too, but he was 100% was God. And he was 100% human, all in one package. Amen. Don't get the wrong idea. Yeshua was God in the flesh. But he was 100% human, 100% God, all, all at once. And uh, he walked really in the perfection of this thing that says of Noah that he continually walked with God. And we need to walk with God, not turn away from him, from him, not forget about him. But in whatever we do, we need to be united with him. Noah walked with God. Noah fathered three sons, Shem, Ham, and Yafet. Uh, so the human race was wiped out and just eight people went forth. Noah, who we know was a righteous man, and Noah's wife. Don't know much about her. I'm going to assume she was a righteous woman. A righteous man is typically going typically to have a righteous woman. I know that personally. <laughs> that was, uh, I'm, I'm lifting her up, but I, that was also kind of a proud thing to say, wasn't it? <laughs> so some of y'all clapped and others sort of scratched your heads. I don't know, I don't know about that. <laughs> so anyway. Moving right along, <laughs> Noah and his wife, let's assume they were righteous, both of them, bet they were, but they had three sons, Shem, Ham, Yafet. Shem was the, you know, he, he was apparently the one that went on in the way of Noah. Uh, Shem, from Shem come forth, come forth the Shemites, the Semitic peoples, the Jews come from Shem and other uh, people in the, in the East. Ham became the forebearer of the African continent and Yafet, um, Europe, and, and also other nations. I don't like to get too much into genealogies because it, it can get kind of weird. But the thing is, these three sons and their three wives, they weren't necessarily Tzadikim. It seems that Shem was, but the other two, not much, especially not Ham. And, um, and who knows about their wives? So you're starting all over again, but it won't be long before you get another messed up world. And that's kind of what happened, isn't it? They repopulated the earth. But now the Lord is about to wipe the slate clean again beginning with one man, one righteous man again, Yeshua, God's own son. Yeshua, like Noah, is the progenitor and author of a new mankind. The difference is that Yeshua, unlike Noah, is able to transform us into a new humanity, one that will not fill the earth with Hamas, but with peace, 
harmony, and brotherly love. Isaiah 2, 4. He will judge between the nations and decide for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning knives. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, nor will they learn war anymore. This is the, the, the kingdom of God. When Yeshua returns and when he gathers people from every continent, from every nation, tribe, and tongue on the face of the earth who have put their trust in Yeshua, and he has a, a, a new mankind transformed And the world will be filled with tzedakah, or justice, righteousness, peace, and brotherly love. After the flood, the family of Noah went forth with the blessing of God, Genesis 9, 1 through 3. God blessed Noah and his sons. And he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the land. The fear and terror of you will be on every wild animal and every flying creature of the sky with everything that crawls on the ground and with all fish of the sea. Into your hand, they're given. Every crawling thing that is alive will be food for you, as are the green plants. I've now given you everything. See, God gave man the dominion over the earth and everything that we could need as far as food, shelter, clothing was ours because... He gave us the earth and everything in it. He actually gave it to Adam to begin with. Now he's confirming that covenant in Noah and his sons. But he's also proclaiming, be fruitful, multiply. So that, uh, you know, with God's covenant and fill the land that will be prosperous and happy. Because everything's there. We, 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 We don't lack anything. But somehow that wasn't enough. And people wanted more, which is a very human trait. So they had the mandate from God to be fruitful and multiply, which they did. But people went, they went to work just as before the flood. They herded animals, they planted vineyards and fields. But all of this is a lot of work. You know, it's got to be a lot of work uh, shepherding flocks and, you know, herding cattle and and uh, sowing and reaping. You know, I guess you sow and you tend to the crops and then you reap. That's a lot of work. And uh, just as God said in casting mankind out of the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3.19, he, he said this is going to be, this is sort of like the curse of God here. You know, and there, there's, There's redemption and there's a blessing, but in casting man out of the garden, he said, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat food. Now, before that, everything was provided in the Garden of Eden. There was no labor. Everything was just there. You just walk around, pick stuff off trees, I guess. I don't know what they did to pass the time, but uh, there was was no labor involved. It's kind of like being in the womb. Everything was provided for. And that's what it means to live by grace. To walk with God, to be with God, as in the garden. But uh, being cast out, now by the sweat of your brow, you're going to eat your food. Meaning you're going to have to work for your stuff now. Until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you will return. So they began to sow and reap and reap and sow, and they cultivated the land and watched over their herds and flocks, led them to pasture. The people were fruitful. They multiplied. They re- replenished the earth after, after the flood. And they ruled over the earth. But I think people began to ask, how can we be free from our labors? And, and God's covenant is clear. If you, you know, take his mandate, be fruitful and multiply, and, and he's given you dominion. Stay true to the faith. And God's covenant blessing means even in our labor, there's freedom 
and there's joy and there's prosperity and peace and happiness even in our labor, even though we know we live only for a short while, even if it's 969 years from dust we came and from dust we return. But we have, if we walk with God, we have life within us and life can never be taken away. Life is eternal. But I think people began to say, you know, how can we be free from this? Why do we have to, you know, sow and reap and be uh, dependent on nature for our food and our clothing? And, 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 uh, and people began to say, let's build something. Not to plant what must be harvested, only to labor to plant again. But let's build something that will remain. Let's make ourselves masters of our own destiny. Genesis 11, verse 3. Now they start talking about bricks. What did anybody ever need bricks for? They've got vineyards and fields and trees of all kinds and flocks and herds and really everything that they could need. Probably lived in tents they made out of animal skins. But now they're talking bricks. They said to one another, come, let's make bricks and bake them until they're hard. So they used bricks for stone and tar for mortar. Prior to that, maybe people did make housing with, with you know, big stones. They could move big stones around and make, make houses and stuff, but they're going to make their own stones now. We're going to make bricks. You can't eat bricks. You know, you can't plant them and grow anything. But, but with bricks, you can build a city. With bricks, we can make a name for ourselves. With bricks, we can become masters of our own destiny because we can build our own world. And this is the kind of thinking that sunk in. Genesis 11, 4. Come, let's build ourselves a city. That's what they did with those bricks. How else are you going to build a city? On rock and roll? <laughs> no, we built this city on bricks, they said. Let's build ourselves a city with a tower whose top reaches into the heavens. Let's make a name for ourselves or else we will be scattered over the face of the whole land. So it was that they built, they started to build a great city and tower. Uh, no one is really quite sure what it was exactly, but it was, the idea of it was plain, you know. No one's quite sure what the tower was. Uh, but uh, city, you know, a city is a city, and it was a great city. And uh, it became known as Babel or Babel because when the Lord saw it, he knew, Houston, we've got a problem here. They would be, they would be so convinced that they could do anything for their own good he confused everyone's speech, 11.6, Genesis 11.6. Now nothing that they plan to do will be impossible. He says, look, the people are one, and all of them have the same language, so this is what they have begun to do. Now nothing they plan to do will be impossible. See, from the Lord's point of view, we can't have that, because then man will think himself master of his own destiny, and the world will again be full of Hamas. So he stopped it temporarily by confusing everyone's tongue. Now, a lot of our technology today is to get out of what happened at Babel, to bring us back together as one where we can communicate. And we're in an age right now where we can communicate at light speed. I, we can communicate right now with people in India through this device right here. It's running through there, through some wires. I don't know how else it works, but I know it works. And a bunch of people in India are either watching this now or they're going to watch it. 
There's other people uh, all around that are that are with us right here, right now. That, that's great. I, I'm not an anti-technology guy. I love it. That's why we use it. But I know it's fake. It's not really the kind of oneness that would ever bring about a world like Isaiah described, where nation will not rise against nation and people will beat their swords into plowshares. Only the Spirit of the Lord can do that. And the Spirit of the Lord can use technology to do that, yes. Amen. But a lot of our technology is born out of, the, out of the desire to finish the job that we started at Babel. We've learned how to get everybody back together on the same page now. And it's great. We can put a man on the moon. We're going to send somebody to Mars. I love it. I think we should go to Mars. It's great, but it's a little scary too. Because we're tempted to think that we're the masters of our own destiny. And when we get to that breaking point, just like we did at Babel, the Lord will step in because he's not going to allow it. He's not going to allow this world to go down, but he'll redeem it. And right now, this world is filled with as much Hamas, injustice, corruption, unrighteousness, violence, cruelty. It's as much, as much Hamas as it ever was in the time of Noah. Yeah. You know, secular humanism which is really what I'm talking about when I keep saying masters of our own destiny. It's based on the belief that we can accomplish anything if only we put our mind to it. And, and, and it's, it's a half truth, really, because you know things like perseverance and commitment and diligence, these are virtues. We teach them to our children, and why not? But they're not virtues when the Lord is left behind. We can have goals and maintain values like discipline, hard work, effort, perseverance, goal setting. All with the recognition that there is one God who is the father of us all. In any other way, all of those characteristics are leading us down a path of destruction. He is in control. He is the life, not me. Galatians 2.20. This is how Paul put it. And uh, it's one of my favorite scriptures. I quote it all the time. It's no longer I who lives, but Messiah lives in me. He, it was a realization that he came to after Yeshua did his thing in him. Because he was a master of his own destiny. He was a master of Torah. He was an intellectual. He was a, a rising star in the rabbinic community. And a great one among the people of Israel. He was on that way. And he was a persecutor of the Messianic Jews. But Yeshua got a hold of him and transformed him. And, and filled him with the Ruach HaKodesh. And at some point he realized the life that I live in the body. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. It's not I who live, but it's God living in me. He is the master of my life and the master of my destiny. And if I can just keep that straight, then goals and hard work and discipline and effort and perseverance and commitment and loyalty and faithfulness become true virtues and accomplishments. When they happen, then I'm not amazed with the accomplishments. I'm amazed at what God did. <laughs> Look and see what the Lord did. Even Yeshua in his trying moment in Luke twenty two forty two said, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours 
be done. Humanly, Yeshua didn't want to suffer crucifixion. Take this cup from me, if you will. But being the son of God, his own will was one with the will of God. So thankfully, he went to the tree for all of us. <laughs> Great things can indeed be accomplished through human will and human effort. You know, I, uh, I learned... Uh, so much about that uh, personally when I was a kid I played football for like 10 11 years and and uh, you know the coaches would get us fired up so that we you know we could tackle anybody or block anybody or run through a bunch of tacklers or whatever it might be it's amazing you know when you get all worked up in the flesh the things that you can accomplish and and um, and then um, I became a youth football coach for about, I don't know, seven, eight years. And um, I, I think I did that through around 2013, 2014. And, and we used to, you know, do the same thing, you know, to, to help the, the kids. They were often scared. You know, we'd get them to believe what they could do. And, and it works because, you know, that's human will, you see. Human will can accomplish a lot. And yet... It has its limits, and human will is a path of destruction unless we can always say, not my will, but yours be done. And it's not to, you know, this whole idea of surrendering uh, to the Lord and, you know, yielding to him. It's not, it's not really even where I'm coming from. You know, everybody has a human will. There's no question, but I'm talking about walking with God. And this recognition that, like Paul said, that the life I live is lived by faith in him. You know, you don't, don't try to do away with your will. Don't try to uh, deny that you have one. Of course you do. But not my will, but yours, Lord. I hope that makes sense to you. Yes. It's, hard, it's hard to explain. But we came from dust, and to dust we shall return. God made us from the dust of the ground. Just like the great empires, gone are the many great empires, Egypt, Persia, Rome. Today's civilization is the last. All of our human works are like castles made of sand. With just a word from the Lord, it's all washed away. Second Peter 3, 6. Apparently, something's fixing to happen again and soon. Through these, the world of that time was destroyed by being flooded with water. But by the same word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire. Kept until the day of judgment. This is verse 7. I guess I didn't give you the second verse. So the first verse, verse 6, refers to the flood. But by the same word, verse 7, the present heavens, there it is, and earth are being reserved for fire kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly people. Oh, that hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen. And it's probably going to happen really soon. And how do we know that? Because God gave us a sign. The end time revival of Israel. The return of Jews back to the land to rebuild the cities and the waste places of old. Has that happened? Yes. Yes. The return of Jewish people to faith in Yeshua, the spiritual revival of Jewish people. Has that happened? Yes. It's happening. It hasn't reached its fullness yet in the restoration of the physical Israel. The physical state of Israel hasn't reached its fullness yet, but it's happening. Jerusalem's been liberated. Jews all around the world are walking around saying, Yeshua's the Messiah, actually. <laughs> It's a sign the fig tree has blossomed. And he's bringing Jewish people together with non-Jewish people to worship together, to be part of the same spiritual community, one in Messiah. He's setting things he's setting things up. He's setting the stage for this event when he will wipe the slate clean. Again, this world is perishing because it's full of Hamas all over again. 
a great and terrible judgment is coming. The end is near. And it's a matter of where we stand. Is God the master of your life? Or are you the master of your own destiny? I hope he's the master of your life tonight. God bless you. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, at this time, we are going to say a blessing over the wine and bread. And I guess Tara and I are doing that. Baruch atarunai Eloheinu melech haolam borei peri hagafen. Amen. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine, in Yeshua's name. He's the fruit of the vine. <laughs> L'chaim. And now I will simulate drinking from the cup. <laughs> Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from out of the earth. In Yeshua's mighty, majestic name. Amen. Amen. Please rise for the ironic benediction. Yivarech echa Adonai v'yishmorecha Yair Adonai panav elecha v'yichunecha Yisa Adonai panav elecha v'yusem lecha Shalom May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and bring you shalom, peace in Yeshua's name. Shabbat shalom. And please remember your tithes and offerings tonight. Thank you. God bless you.